This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Graduate Council of the Academic Senate, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you today to the first of three Hitchcock lectures to be given by Professor Michael Coe. The Hitchcock professorship is one of the earliest and most cherished endowments at the University of California, Berkeley. It was developed from a small bequest of property made in 1885 by Charles M. Hitchcock, a San Francisco physician with an extensive interest in education. The intention of his bequest was to establish a professorship at the University of California for the purpose of giving free lectures on scientific and practical subjects. The 19th century, of course, was a practical age. In 1930, Dr. Hitchcock's daughter, Lily Hitchcock Coit, yes, of Coit Tower fame, contributed additional funds to the, member, the memory of her father and mother. She was, during her lifetime, considered one of San Francisco's most colorful figures. An enthusiastic supporter of education, Mrs. Coit regularly mingled with the intellectual giants of her day uh, in this area, such as Robert Louis Stevenson, Joaquin Miller, and Professor LeConte of the University of California. Her generous bequest greatly extended her father's original gift, making it possible for the university to liberalize the terms of the professorship and to present a series of Hitchcock professors. The fund has become one of the most cherished endowments of the University of California, sustaining and encouraging recognition of the highest distinction of scholarly thought and achievement. The great extent to which this endowment has enabled the university community to become closely acqu acquainted with distinguished scholars throughout the academic world is demonstrated by the incredible list in your programs, I hope you saw that, of those who have served as the Hitchcock lecturers and Hitchcock professors. It really is a who's who of, of science in America. The university is proud to see the tradition of the Hitchcock professorship so eminently upheld by Professor Michael Coe. Now, I have to say I was particularly excited about meeting Ms. Dr. Coe this, this afternoon and having his lecture, hearing his lecture. I went to uh, Chichen Itza in Ishmael in 1977, and it was, in my mind, one of the most exciting trips of my life to see at that time they were just starting to decipher the language, and it was absolutely thrilling to see. Professor Coe is the Charles J. McCurdy Professorship of, Professor of Anthropology Emeritus at Yale University. He is considered by many to be one of the foremost authorities on the ethno-history of Mesoamerica, the historical archaeology of northeastern United States, and writing systems. His contributions to these fields constitute a major development in the understanding of the evolution of ancient civilizations. Twenty years ago, the hieroglyphic inscriptions of ruined Mayan monuments were largely unreadable. Today, thanks to several extraordinary breakthroughs, most of these inscriptions have been deciphered. As archaeologists and anthropologists explore the veritable wealth of information on these inscribed remains, they have discovered how Mayan language developed and was rendered into art by scribes. These authors, both men and women, were highly appreciated in a world where literature, art, and mathematics reached unusual heights. This sophisticated Mayan writing system has shed light on the mysterious history and culture of this ancient and complex society. In his lecture today, entitled Deciphering the Mayan Script, What We Know and What We Don't Know, Professor Ko presents the modern understanding of the intricate hieroglyphic in ins inscriptions constituting the Mayan code. Without further delay, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Professor Michael Ko. Thank you, Madam Dean. 
Uh, it really is a scary thing to look at the list of previous lecturers, and I don't know whatever got into the committee to select me, especially when I heard that these are supposed to be practical matters here. You'll hear three lectures about the most impractical things you ever heard about in your life uh, in these three days. So I can't pretend you're going to learn anything that you will ever be able to use to do anything practical uh, here. But as, I, as uh, uh, has been said, uh, things have changed in science, and we don't demand practicality uh, anymore, which is a good thing. Uh, the story I'm going to tell uh, this afternoon is essentially uh, one of uh, scientific uh, discovery, and one that is absolutely continuing. Uh, it's been said, and often said in the uh, journals and by newspaper uh, writers uh, in uh, uh, journals and uh, newspapers that uh, the code has been completely cracked. We can read everything, or we can read 85% of the Maya inscriptions, or we can read 92%. Uh, you'll find out this afternoon that that isn't exactly 100% uh, uh, true. There's a lot of things we don't know about the Maya script and about the Maya themselves, but we've got the means to find these things out. And the basic thing is that uh, with the script largely deciphered, uh, there are things about Maya mentality and the about the way these people thought uh, back in the centuries uh, from about 300 to 900 AD that we would never have known otherwise. We have a chance to see a Native American people in ancient times through their own eyes and in their own words for the very first time. And I think that's exciting. When I was a student at uh, uh, Harvard, first entering this field, and my God, it, it was uh, uh, almost 50 years ago, or more than 50 years ago, uh, we really didn't know anything. And so what I'd like to do without further fanfare is to show you what we do know and how we came about to find it. Then I'll talk about maybe what we don't know and what lies uh, ahead. So could we have the first uh, slide? And uh, the lights dim, please. Now, I'm the kind of person who talks from slides. And if the projector goes off, I've had it. <laughs> uh, this once happened to me in Mexico. And I had to tread water. And the governor of Veracruz, where I was lecturing, said, tell jokes. So, <laughs> so I told jokes for half an hour in a language that wasn't my own until a new projector could be found. So at any rate, we'll start. Now, this is the area that we're talking about, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, and in particular, the lowlands. The highlands were never really concerned in the whole story of the writing system that I'm going to be described. For some reason, uh, the uh, tremendous numbers of highland Maya organized into various uh, states and tribes never really adapted uh, writing. This is peculiarly a lowland tropical forest uh, phenomenon and begins probably in this region of the southern Maya area in northern Guatemala, neighboring Belize, neighboring Mexico, uh, around 200, 250 AD. Although earlier writing is known, we really can't read it. But by about 250 to 300 AD, we're beginning to get inscriptions that we can read. Uh, there are also inscriptions from Yucatan. There are an immense number of uh, there is an immense number of uh, inscriptions on uh, other materials, such as ceramics and so forth. And I'll be touching upon that uh, this afternoon. So that's the area. Now, when the first explorers came through this region, in particular, uh, the great, uh, of, greatest of all explorers, uh, John Lloyd Stevens, and uh, an American diplomat, and his uh, uh, English topographical artist companion who pr provided the illustrations for Stevens' books. When these two, Stevens and Catherwood, first came through this area, uh, they never saw this, Tikal, but they saw many other uh, Maya cities. They came across inscriptions. Uh, they had not a clear idea how old these cities were, but they saw that these people had writing. Uh, in fact, it was known since the late 18th century uh, through early Spanish reports that these people had uh, writing that was not like anything else that they had ever come across in the New World. 
but they couldn't read it. They wondered who these people were who had made this. This writing system, and that last slide was, by the way, of Tikal from a helicopter, or the, uh, one of the two largest of all and most powerful of all Maya cities in classic times. When they came across these inscriptions, they saw a very complicated writing system. This is uh, a wooden lintel, a, a fragment, a, a, a section of a wooden lintel that uh, is in one of the buildings at uh, uh, Tikal, or was at one point, uh, with many, many hieroglyphs on it, uh, vaguely resembling some of the hieroglyphic systems of the old world, like Egyptian. Um, obviously not a, a clear-cut alphabet, something that could be easily read. The tremendous amount of variation in how those hieroglyphs were carved and uh, a tremendous numbers of those hieroglyphs. And it really puzzled people. They did not know what to do with this. However, uh, when the earliest publications began coming out with illustrations, uh, some particularly astute minds got to work on this. Uh, the one of the puzzling things about Maya writing and why it has been so slow to decipher this is the extraordinary latitude that the Maya artists and scribes had in putting these hieroglyphs down. Uh, there's probably no other hieroglyphic writing system in the world uh, where such a freedom was granted to individual scribes. Certainly not in Egypt, uh, perhaps even not in China with its great calligraphic tradition. These people uh, could uh, had a tremendous number of variations that they could draw upon to write their uh, text down. And this has really thrown people off for, for many, many uh, years. But as I said, uh, they, the earliest uh, scholars in this field in the mid-19th century, in, particularly in Europe and particularly in Germany, had some material to work on. Uh, they had a Maya book that had shown up in the 18th century, in, uh, first in Vienna, and then later on became incorporated in the Royal Library of Saxony in Dresden, where it is today. This is the Dresden Codex. Uh, this particular book here, and it was published, pages from it were published early on by the German scientist Alexander von Humboldt uh, early in the 19th century. So they, people could look at inscriptions, and they could look at pages from this book, and they concluded that they were dealing with one and the same system. That is, the writing that was on the stone monuments and on wooden lintels and so forth was done by the same people who made that particular book. Later on, other books were found. There's only four of them known today in the world, uh, uh, ancient Maya books, unfortunately. That's one of the problems that I'll come to at the end of the lecture. Well, one particularly astute guy named uh, Raffines, Constantine Raffines, rather a rascal uh, in many respects, a bit of a charlatan, but an interesting man who lived in Philadelphia, he was born in Constantinople, lived in Philadelphia, was a jack of all trades as far as science went. And he saw uh, that the numbers, th that there were bars and dots that which probably stood for numbers, and that the dots in any one number never exceeded four. Therefore, a five would be shown with a bar. He figured out the bar and dot system of the Maya, which I'm not going to belabor. I'm sure you all know it anyway. The Maya operated in their number system with an extremely simple uh, 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 method of using only three symbols, basically. The dot, the bar, and for the zero, they used a stylized shell. And here are bar and dot numbers written. Raffines figured this out. He had it figured out in the 1830s. And that is the first step towards the decipherment of the Maya hieroglyphic system. Somebody else wrote very, very early also, and I'll come back to him uh, later on. This was a Spanish friar, later bishop of Yucatan, named Diego de Landa. Diego de Landa uh, was a terrifying man. Uh, he was uh, beloved and hated by the Maya at the same time, a very complicated person. He perpetrated an inquisition, a primitive inquisition, on the Maya of Yucatan in the 16th century, for which he was recalled to Spain and censured. And while he was there, he wrote down everything he knew about the Maya. 
This manuscript of his, or at least a copy, a later copy, was discovered in a Spanish archive in the mid-19th century by an extraordinary French abbe uh, who discovered many, many important Maya manuscripts and uh, was published by him. And in this, Bishop Landa gave what he said was the way these Maya wrote. Uh, an ABC. And here is a page from Landa's uh, manuscript here giving how they wrote according to him. He said they wrote with these letters, that this was an alphabet. Uh, Brasseur de Bourbourg, the French abbe, made the terrible mistake of trying to use that uh, as an alphabet on one of the Maya early Maya books that he, as a matter of fact, had discovered in a uh, library in Europe. And, of course, it was pure gobbledygook. Nothing, it did not work. Uh, in fact, he was reading the glyphs backwards, which was no, no help at all. This discredited the whole approach and the whole idea of using the so-called Landa alphabet, the abeceario that he had there, to decipher the hieroglyphs. And for a century after the discovery of this, this was considered to be a fraud, that Landa had had the wool pulled over his eyes, that there was no such system at all. But we'll come back to that. Landa's uh, manuscript, uh, the Relación de las Cosas de Yucatán, the uh, account of the things of Yucatan uh, is really the, the absolute uh, entry into the, the world of the Maya. Uh, it's, it's really a, an extremely important work. He not only gave that where he said was how you wrote uh, Maya and could read it, but he gave the uh, calendar system in its abbreviated form. He gave us the names of the days in a count of never-ending count of 20 days uh, here, which coordinated with, uh, in a permutation calendar, with the numbers 1 through 13, uh, giving a 260-day uh, 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 calendar. Uh, this was uh, in Landa's manuscript, and scholars in Europe quickly could see that that's how uh, the basic Maya calendar worked. At the same time, he gave us a list of <coughs> the uh, months of a 365-day year. Uh, there were 18 months of 20 days each, and they're all given here with the names that appear in Landa and the hieroglyphs, as we now know they are in the inscriptions in the stone and wooden monuments. Uh, so 18 times 20 is 360, with five extra days left over at the end of the year, during which the New Year rites were celebrated for the next year, the Wayab uh, days. Added up, that's the year, the solar year of 365 days, approximately. They, they knew uh, that it was 365 and a quarter days, but for uh, reasons, mathematical reasons, and reasons having to do with their astronomy, they uh, did not take leap years into account. Uh, those two cycles, the 365-day cycle here and the 260-day uh, cycle permutated against each other. This was again all worked out in the mid-19th century, uh, particularly by the librarian of the Royal Library of Saxony, a man named Ernst Furstemann, who was an incredible guy. He worked out the, almost the entire Maya calendar just sitting in his, in his uh, dusty old office there uh, in, a, in the library in Saxony without ever setting foot in the New World. Uh, he worked the whole thing out. And it gives one a, a cycle of approximately 52 years before any one day in this calendar, like one pop, will meet a day in the 260-day calendar, like one con. Uh, that only happens about once. Well, it's 52 times 365. And we call that the calendar round. And that is the basic Maya calendar and the basic of all, basis of all Mesoamerican ritual calendars. So that they could read, they began to be able to read the calendar uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Firstman worked, as I say, on the Dresden Codex. This is a page from the Dresden Codex. And as Firstman discovered uh, in, uh, on these particular pages uh, that uh, it's a, it's a sequence of uh, uh, pages in the Dresden Codex that it concerned the planet Venus. Uh, it was a 584-day calendar having to do with the heliacal risings of Venus, coordinated with the 365-day year and the 260-day uh, uh, calendar. 
Uh, well, this was a fantastic discovery because for the first time we began to see astronomy in the Maya writing system. There's still many things we don't know about the uh, non-calendrical glyphs here, names of gods and so forth, that we know what approximately what they are, but the, uh, the fine meanings of this have yet to be worked out. There's a lot of work still to be done on these codices. We've spent much, much more time on the stone monuments because it's far more uh, glamorous. But at any rate, there's a lot of astronomy in the Dresden Codex, including an eclipse calendar, which by the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century had been worked out by astronomers. Uh, extraordinary eclipse calendar. The late 19th century was a great time of exploration in the Maya area. Uh, this is when the first great expeditions uh, were mounted by universities like uh, Harvard and uh, Penn, uh, and by uh, particularly by a private individual, uh, Alfred P. Maudsley, an Englishman who married a very rich Californian woman and therefore had a, had a, a, a more or less uh, uh, a continuous uh, uh, fund in his pocket to pay for anything. And uh, he made a wonderful record of all the known monuments that he could find, um, the hieroglyphic inscriptions on them in beautiful drawings and photographs and uh, casts that became the basis for all subsequent work on Maya hieroglyphic writing. Published in the Biologia Centrale Americana, one of the great, great scientific uh, um, advances of the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th. Man just worked by himself with no great fame uh, coming to him, and yet he was the most important figure of his day in Maya studies. So it wasn't long before they had uh, worked out on the Maya monuments, on the carved stone monuments, a great deal of the calendrics. There's one other system that is added to the 52-year calendar round uh, uh, in, on the classic monuments. Now, when I say classic, I mean uh, essentially the period between A.D. 250 and A.D. 900, by which time classic Maya civilization was pretty much in disarray and they were no longer erecting dated stone monuments. But there is another kind of dating that appears on these monuments, and we call that the long count, a day-to-day -day system uh, consisting of cycles of various magnitudes that are all to be added up, uh, added together, and taken from a starting date in the year 3114 BC. Don't please ask me why 3114 BC. Nobody knows why they picked that a particular date in August then. It's obviously long before the Maya calendar was invented, but it's retrospective. Uh, it's uh, sort of like the way uh, various calendars in the Western world begin when something supposedly happened. So this is a day-to-day -day count uh, that uh, is to be all added up, and uh, it's often the first thing that appears on a Maya monument. It's what we call the initial series. Uh, that's it. That's the long count there, uh, which is all to be added up, reaching a particular day, uh, this one, in the 260-day count. And then there's another batch of stuff that appears on a typical Maya monument. All this was worked out in the early 20th century uh, by uh, a extraordinary collaboration between astronomers and uh, epigraphers, people who work on ancient Maya systems. And I'll show you what that is. That supplementary series is essentially uh, worrying about uh, the moon. They were worried about eclipses. And uh, they grouped the moons into uh, groups of six. And all of these are lunar glyphs which tell you exactly the age of the moon since the last new moon, when you basically can't see any light on the moon, uh, until that particular day. Um, and as I say, it groups them into uh, groupings of six, which has to do with eclipse prediction. Um, to have something happen and have an eclipse on that day would have been absolutely calamitous. But you can see there's a huge number of hieroglyphs that are involved in this, and they were all read uh, essentially by the 1920s. Everything could be read, uh, or 1930s. This is the upper part of a Maya stela from the site of Piedras Negras on the uh, Usamacinta River, which divides Guatemala from, uh, from Mexico. It's on the Guatemalan side. 
It's a site that has been worked uh, on by uh, uh, several expeditions, beginning with Pennsylvania and more recently by uh, Brigham Young University under my former student, uh, Steve Houston. Uh, this is the upper part of a monument. I'll go forward and just say that this is a woman, happens to be a queen, a very important queen of this particular uh, state or polity. Uh, and th there's the, the bottom part of the monument is not shown here. And you can see up here how much of this monument is taken up with calendrics and with lunar inscriptions. Uh, it got to be so that uh, because they could not tackle th the hieroglyphs that were not part of these lunar or long count inscriptions, it got to, or not part of the calendrical system, it got to be where people threw up their hands basically by the 1930s and 1940s and said, basically, there can't be much in that. There's so few of those hieroglyphs, they can't be anything but commentaries on the time system. That basically, these people were worshiping time. And uh, this was all about astronomy and time and had nothing to do with history or real people or anything like that. Well, this turned out to be completely wrong. The person who really uh, uh, summed up all of that uh, and who was the most important figure in Maya research in the whole first half of the 20th century was J. Eric S. Thompson, later Sir Eric Thompson, who was a brilliant scholar, uh, absolutely commanded everything in the field. He commanded everything but a real knowledge of what writing systems were, were about and had no interest whatsoever in writing systems anywhere else in the world. He had no interest in the comparative approach. The Maya were unique, and their writing system was basically about their religious attitude towards the world. He himself was a deeply religious man, and uh, he projected this upon, well, the Mayas are too, but he projected his own viewpoint uh, back onto the Maya in a way that really held up Maya research for a long, long time. He was a scary man in many respects. Uh, he could tear you apart when he got behind the typewriter. He <laughs> did it to me several times, uh, and I still bear the wounds of this. Uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant man, and he was a hard person to argue about. He said that London's uh, uh, ABC was a total phony, that it could barely be used for anything, that there, were, there was no phonetics uh, in, basically in the writing system, that it had very little to do with the Maya, spoken Maya language, that it was not recording speech in the way that we know it ourselves, but rather it was expressing their esoteric view towards the other world and their philosophy of, of life. And it really, this is the way it looked in 1950 when uh, he brought out his uh, big book on Maya hieroglyphic writing. Well, this began to break. This whole system began to break down uh, when Thompson was still alive, as a matter of fact. Uh, Thompson worked for the Carnegie Institution of Washington, and then he retired and moved uh, back to his native England. But he continued to be very, very active in the field. Um, a person named uh, Heinrich or Henry Berlin who lived in Mexico as a refugee from Hitler's Germany and was in the wholesale grocery business there, got really interested in the in ancient Maya inscriptions, particularly the site of Palenque, but he was interested in them all. And he discovered that each Maya site with a large body of inscriptions on stele, on lintels, and so forth, had a glyph that was peculiar to itself, a hieroglyph that was peculiar to itself, and he called that a, an emblem glyph. And he published his paper in 1953 or 54 uh, on the emblem glyphs in Maya hieroglyphic uh, uh, writing and suggested that they were either the name of the city, this happens to be the one for Tikal, seen here in the background, the emblem glyph for Tikal, or they were the name of the lineage or polity that ran it. Well, it turns out to be closer to the second uh, supposition. If so, he said, then there might be real history in these inscriptions. We should start looking for historical data. And this was a brilliant breakthrough. It was the first crack in the edifice that Thompson and his predecessors had put up. Uh, 
he uh, uh, published uh, emblem glyphs for a number of Maya sites. Many, many more are known now uh, that are peculiar to that. And they essentially, here's one, for instance, for uh, Naranjo. Let's, or, let, yeah, let's take the one for Naranjo. It's got a prefix here. In front, this is the main sign that I've colored in here, a prefix, and these two little signs up here. Uh, we now know that this is to be read holy, oh, which means uh, holy, oh, or oh, oh, the holy. We, this is the name of the place, probably, or the name of the, of the polity, or the name of the lineage that is the ruling family in that particular place. And these two little glyphs up here are to be read ahau. We now know this in retrospect, I'm running ahead, which means king or uh, lord. So this is the holy king of the site of Naranjo. That's not its ancient name at all. This is the uh, uh, emblem glyph, one of the two emblem glyphs of the site of Palenque. So this is the name of Palenque, which happens to be Bach or bone. That's a stylized bone. This is a skull, which is also Bach. This is holy, so it's oh, Bach Achau, the Holy Lord of Palenque. That is a title, actually, not the name of a place or the name of a lineage, but a title that follows the name of the individual who happens to be the ruler at that time. And as I say, we know a large number of these. It began to be, now we could start looking for some history. And the person who did this was Tatyana Proskuryakov, a uh, Russian exile. She'd come over as a young girl and had worked as an artist for the Carnegie Institution of Washington at Piedras Negras, which is a site along the Usamacinta River uh, that I've just talked about, um, and worked at other places, including Chichen Itza, did some wonderful reconstructions in watercolors for Carnegie of those. But she got really interested in Maya hieroglyphic writing, like a lot of people. Uh, in 1960, she had begun her work in the 1950s. By 1960, she published a paper in American Antiquity that revolutionized the field completely. Uh, this is her reconstruction of the uh, center of the site of Piedras Negras with the Usamacinta River in the background. That's Mexico, that's Guatemala on that side. Uh, and the river is uh, running down this way to the Gulf Coast. This is a great Acropolis there, as it was probably in about 700 A.D. or 750 A.D. And in front of this uh, pyramid here is a bunch of stele, stone, standing stone monuments. There's another series over here. By means of analyzing the long count dates on those monuments, she showed that if you subtract the earliest date given on, on a series of monuments, one particular series from the latest date is never longer than a possible person's lifetime. And therefore, she said that probably, and it turns out to be true, that this series of stele here record the events in a one particular ruler's lifetime. And she published this in 1960. Thompson at first rejected it right out of hand, and then he <laughs> he, t he took the paper to bed with him, read it in bed. The next morning, he came and said, Tanya, you're right. Uh, he gave up, which is amazing for Thompson. This be revolutionized the field. We now know that these inscriptions concern history. Um, she discovered uh, two extremely important verbal glyphs. Luckily, for in Maya inscriptions, the verbs immediately follow the date. Uh, you have first the date, then you have the verb, then you have the object, then you have the subject. Um, and this is the way Maya writing works and the way that Maya languages work. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the one that she found, the verb that she found went with to be born. This is when the person was born. This went with the earliest date, and it's, this is siyach. Siyach, uh, it means he is born. It's a passive expression. We now can, can read this with all of its grammar. This uh, particular expression here uh, is when he was inaugurated into the office, X number of years after he was born. So we are getting real history. She then turned her attention, uh, after her 1960 paper, to the site of Yaschilan, on the Mexican side of the river, upstream from uh, uh, Piedras Negras on the Usamacinta River. And uh, these buildings at Yaschilan have lintels, stone lintels above the doorways. 
Uh, some of these were taken by Mosley to the British Museum, very beautiful ones. And she found the dynastic records of Yashchilan on these lintels. The first time anybody had really worked on complete dynastic records other than Piedras Negras. And she found the records of two extremely important individuals there in the late classic, in the 8th century. Uh, this guy here, whose name is up here as Bird Jaguar, he's a perpetrator of this, which is a capture going on of two individuals. He has an, uh, uh, a stooge here, a problem, perhaps a provincial governor or a military leader uh, whose title is Sahal. We know that these people, that's what they did. Uh, and it says that on 7 Emish 14 Sec, in the 52-year calendar round, Chukach, uh, he is captured. A guy called Jeweled Skull, who's labeled here on this particular uh, captive here, and then it says here, we now can read this phonetically, uh, Ubak, um, it is his captive, the captive of, U is possessive, his captive, and this is the uh, subject, Bird Jaguar, he is the captor, and he is the holy lord, he is the holy king of Yashchilan, that's the Yashchilan uh, emblem glyph. Um, this, uh, uh, refers to the capture by his Sahal of this particular individual here, whose name is, appears right up uh, uh, in here. So this stuff is history now. Uh, she never was interested in phonetic writing. Uh, she was interested in it, but she never published on it. And she stayed clear of it. It was simply, she said, this is what the subject matter, this is what it means, but she doesn't say at any time, how do you pronounce it? Here is the uh, father of uh, Bird Jaguar, who she identified, uh, performing a ritual of bloodletting. This woman, his wife, is pulling, uh, the queen is pulling a thorn-studded rope through her, uh, a hole in her tongue, and uh, his name appears up here in this inscription uh, up here, and this all has to do with this particular ritual on this Yashilan uh, little. That little, by the way, we now can read the whole thing. Well, how do you pronounce it? What language is all this stuff in? This is where the great, another great scholar comes into the picture. Uh, and this happened of all places in the Soviet Union, the last place you would expect to, to, to find this. Uh, in the, in the, the 1952, the 1953, a young scholar, a uh, Soviet scholar named Yuri uh, Knorozov, who had been in the Second World War and had been on the last final battle for Berlin and had survived, Yuri Knorozov was a student of Egyptian, of various hieroglyphic systems. He decided on looking at Landa, that Landa held the key to the writing system, that nobody had really looked at it uh, with the right eyes and asked the right question of Landa's alphabet. And what he found was, in brief here, because I don't have time to go into this, it was a, the great discovery, along with uh, Tanya Praskuryakov's uh, study of Piedras Negras, he found that this was a syllabary, that each one of these signs generally stood for a vowel, for a consonant followed by a vowel, like ko or lu or something of this sort, or le, rather than being a simple alphabetic letter, a consonant or a vowel, except for the vowels themselves, the pure vowels, which had their own signs. Using the values given by Landa, which were clearly the way Landa would have pronounced those Spanish letters in the Spanish of his time. He was able, by going to the codices and using the method of substitution uh, very, very cleverly to find out that those uh, signs that Landa had given were used to write phonetically uh, in the Dresden Codex above various gods' names. For instance, uh, this is a, uh, a macaw, which is mo in all Maya languages, and uh, by means of clever substitutions, he found the sign for mo, and then this given by Landa twice, o, -o which is a glottalized o, mo, which means macaw. Uh, he saw that this was a reduplicated Landa's ko, which is ko, ko, which is quetzal uh, bird in all Maya languages, is ko. He came up with the principle of sin harmony, that basically when they wrote a word that was consonant, vowel consonant, like ook, 
they would use two symbols, in this case reduplicated ku, and the second vowel uh, that was not pronounced would have to match the first vowel. He called that sin harmony. So this would be written ku ku, but actually pronounced uh, ku. And I'm not going to go into all of those, but it was really an amazing breakthrough. Um, from, but it was rejected by Thompson out of hand right away, and all of Thompson's minions and many followers in the United States and elsewhere and in Germany, except by a lucky few. And I was a graduate student at Harvard at that point, and like all graduate students, I kicked my elders in the shins as much as I could, and I decided that Knorozov was right. And a few others uh, did the same thing at the time, but we were lone voices in the wilderness. It turns out Knorozov is right. There is a large Maya syllabary. We're still working on that. Uh, there are still, we can make a grid uh, here uh, with the uh, consonants on the left and the vowels uh, up on the top. We can make a grid system like this. There are still parts of the grid that need to be filled in. But essentially, all of the signs that Landa gave and many more are phonetic, and they are uh, uh, being used as a syllabary. Uh, there's a lot of work to, still to be done on that. It's very tough work. This is how Knorozov proposed the system work. He proposed it as a logosyllabic system. You could take a sign like this, which is a picture of a jaguar's head, and say that is Balam, which is jaguar in all Maya languages. Uh, the problem is that there are other spotted cats besides a jaguar. There's ocelots and margays, for instance, down in the area. Did they mean that, or did they mean the Balam? So the Maya scribe would take one of these syllable signs, uh, phonetic syllable signs, and add it to the front of that as a phonetic complement to show that this is a this is a jaguar this is a spotted cat that has a sound ba in front of it. In other words, balam. Or he could say it has the sound m at the end of it, or ma, using the synharmonic principle. So we put Landa's ma sign back to this is balam ma, but the ah wouldn't be pronounced. Or he could put the ba and the ma there, both of them, as phonetic complements. Or he could write the whole thing as ba, la, ma. All of these were choices that the scribe could make and did make, which is why it's been so hard to decipher this writing system. He could write, the Maya scribe could write the name of one of Palenque's great kings, the greatest king of Palenque, Pakal, who built the Temple of the Inscriptions and whose sarcophagus is buried within it. Uh, died as an 80-year-old man. This is his, what we would call a logographic sign, which is a shield, a hand shield, which is Pakal in Maya. That's his name, written as a word sign or logograph. Here it is with, with the sound la at the end of it to say it's a, it's a shield, but it's got an L sound on the end of it. So it's Pakal with a la there. Or another way of writing it with phonetic, phonetically would be to write it all phonetically. Pa, the sign pa, this fish sign is ka, and that's la, pa ka la, or pa kal. That's another way of showing it. So all of these things were possible. It, we call it logosyllabic. Most writing, ancient writing systems of the world are logosyllabic. This has been established beyond a shadow of a doubt the way the Maya writing system works. It's complex not only because they had so much choice on what signs they could choose from, because uh, they, you could have as many as five signs for a single sound, uh, but they could also conflate uh, the signs. So you could take a sign like chum, which means to be seated, um, and tun, which means stone, this is um, um, a, a sign that this is the seating of the, of the monument or, or, or seating of the year uh, uh, or what have you. It could be jammed together as chum tun, or they could take this sign here, which is a tun or stone sign, and shove it inside this, which is actually somebody squatting the lower part of the body, and conflate it down to even something like that where it's barely visible. So all of this, the epigrapher has to look for. It takes an amazing amount of uh, visual memory to decipher this. Well, one of the guys who does it best of all, he's not the only one, there are a large number of very good epigraphers now, is David Stewart, who received the MacArthur uh, uh, Genius Grant at age 18, the youngest person ever to get it. 
and uh, who has made amazing strides in examining and trying to find new phonetic signs and trying to work out how logographs were actually pronounced from their phonetic substitutions. And it's a, been a tremendous thing. He's now at Harvard. One of the things he discovered was the, were the signs for artists. These were one of the, the only people in the New World who actually signed their works of art. Other peoples had writing systems in Mesoamerica, but only among the classic Maya do you find signatures. And there are scribal, these are always prefixed by scribal uh, uh, titles. Uh, this sign is just two ways of writing the same thing, ach, which means he of the, he of the, tzi bi, he of the writing. This is another way of writing it, ach, tzi ba, or also uh, he of the writing, uh, which means scribe. Whenever you see that, that will be usually followed by the name of that particular scribe. If it's a carved monument rather than a painted one, you will find yushul, the carving of, and then the name of the particular carver. This one down here he identified as being two ways of writing the sign itzat. Itzat means the, the, the knowledgeable one, the sabio, the wise man, uh, often given to scribes because they were the wise people. One of the things that's become quite clear uh, in recent years, that is in the last several decades, has been that uh, most Maya writing is not on the monuments, but on s Maya vessels uh, from Maya tombs, classic Maya tombs. This is actually a cylindrical vessel that has been rolled out photographically, and it's got a long inscription on the top. I messed around with these things back in the early 1970s and discovered that there's a standard inscription on the top here, which then stops, and then you have the personal name of the person who dedicated or who uh, was a patron or patroness of that particular artist who inscribed it. This is the word uh, 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 his writing or the, the, the writing of. This actually describes the shape of the vessel we now know, which is a cylindrical vessel, and I'll talk about that in my chocolate uh, uh, lecture because this is a chocolate pot. That happens to be the hieroglyph for chocolate. Uh, but these turn out to be immensely important, and there's where you often find the names of scribes on these vessels. They're very proud of this. Uh, working on uh, classic Maya pottery has opened up an entire new world of Maya religious thought, including uh, the gods of the scribes. The scribes were the priests of this ancient civilization. They were the ones in whom all knowledge was. They were the masters of ceremony. Uh, they, were, they were the keepers of the royal books. Uh, they were the all in all to the king and his court. This is one of the gods of the scribes who's a, who's a monkey man scribe pointing to something in a Maya codex or, or book that has been bound uh, in jaguar skin. Uh, this is an old patron god of the scribes, a detail from a Maya ceramic vessel, who is instructing in bar and dot numeration uh, a pupil over here in how to read the mathematical uh, details in a book that's down here, which is a folding screen book with jaguar skin covers. Uh, we know a lot about the gods of the scribes now. The monuments, uh, David uh, Stewart showed us how to, to find the names of the people who carved the monuments, often many sculptors on the same monument, a whole committee, in fact. This is Yushul, the carving of, and this is the name of the particular person who is actually uh, owned uh, by, he is the sculptor of, the artist of, he's owned by the king of Yashchilan, by the holy Yashchilan lord. It uh, happens to be a monument at Bonan Park, uh, which is a lesser site uh, actually within the polity of Yashchilan. If you look at a monument like this, which is a very large classic Maya panel of the 8th century, you will find here the name of the sculptor who actually carved this beautiful monument. There is Yushul, his carving, the carving of, and then three hieroglyphs down here which can be read, which give the name of that particular person. So now we can identify individual hands even on these monuments. 
These scribes, we now know from David Stewart's study, were very high-ranking people. This is an inscription, a, a, a painted inscription, off a beautiful classic Maya vase from the city of Naranjo. And here is the name of the artist. It says Utsib, his writing. Here is the name of that particular artist who came from a place uh, who called himself Ahmasham, he of Masham, which is another name for Naranjo, like the guy from Brooklyn or the Bronx. Uh, he's telling you where he's from. This we now know means the son of and a woman who is a queen from the site of Yashha here. That's the emblem glyph of Yashha. These are female prefixes identified by Proskuryakov is identifying women. This is a queen who came from Yashha, and he is the son of the king of Naranjo. That's his name, and there's the Naranjo emblem. This man is a prince, and he was an extremely important Maya ceramic artist uh, in the royal court. So the artists we now know from the glyphs were very, very high-ranking people. The highest, probably, and most prestigious of all was uh, uh, the uh, scribe and keeper of the royal books. And here, from an uh, onyx marble vase, classic Maya down in Washington now, is his title, which is Ah, oh, holy, Ah, he of the oh, hun, of the holy books. He of the holy books. He's the royal librarian and master of ceremonies to the king, and he is actually possessed, according to the inscription, by the king. He's part of his court. This is from a plate from uh, the Tikal area, and uh, there's Utsib, his writing, and then it goes on to name the scribe here, whose name is uh, Akhnikte, uh, turtle flower, and it says he is the Yakuhun, uh, he is the Akuhun, the keeper of the holy books of this personage who is a, uh, a, 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 a royal king of Tikal. That's a Tikal uh, emblem glyph. You can read basically all of this now. One of the things that David Stewart and Carl Tauba and Steve Houston, the last two students of mine, did was to show that there are glyphs for pottery shapes also on the pottery. This is what we call name tagging. The Maya were very flat-footed about the way they wrote. They wanted to write down the names of everything. Like I would write down, this is a lectern, this is a microphone. This is the way they did it. Uh, they had to name every object in their universe. And so they named, uh, when you find this glyph, it means ulak, his plate. This is uhawante, this means a dish with three legs like that. This particular one uh, describes a tall vessel. We now know it was used for the chocolate making uh, ritual. Here is a lock, a Maya dish, a beautiful one. This is known as the resurrection plate. I can't go into this here, but it shows the resurrection of the maize god here by his two sons, the hero twins, whose glyphs are given here and here. This is the maize god's glyph from the split surface of the earth and they are watering him. He's a corn plant coming up. And it uh, says up here, this is part of the standard inscription, and then dedicating it. And it says here, it's Ulak, his plate, uh, or hers. And then it gives the name of the individual who commissioned this particular uh, plate. I'll come to this in the next lecture. This is a humdinger. This is a, a screw top jar ceramic from the 5th century AD in a site called Rio Azul in northeastern Guatemala, where David Stewart found uh, here uh, the name of the contents of that particular thing. And I'll talk about that next time. It's chocolate. Uh, this is the Maya hieroglyph for chocolate. So name tagging, we call this, where you put the names of things and then give the owner, is very, very common. Everything was name tagged, even Maya Steely, big stone monuments were name tagged. Uh, this is a uh, name tag on a, uh, an obsidian ear spool from a site in Belize, and it says Utup, Utupa, pronounced Utup. Utup means uh, his ear spool. Tup is Earspool, and this gives the name of the king, the ruler of that particular site in Belize, and it says, okay, that's, that's, that's his Earspool, and don't anybody be fooled to think otherwise. 
This is from a bone uh, found in a royal tomb, a great royal tomb at Tikal. And uh, this is the, the name of the ruler who we now know is Hasal Chankawil. And he is the, uh, uh, the holy king of Tikal. And what does it say? It says Ubak here, his bone. It tells you, okay, what else is it but his bone? But they wanted to know, and they wanted you to know. There's a lot of Maya hieroglyphic writing that has to do on the monuments that has to do with a, a warlike Maya. The Maya were not peaceful by a long, long shot, and there are many, many military monuments that concern military things. Um, the, the whole groups of epigraphers have been working on this, and uh, we now know that this particular kind of thing with a star on, star on top, that, believe it or not, is a star, the way they wrote star, over something else, like over the sign for Earth, or over this sort of shell-like thing, or over the emblem glyph for another city, it means that war is, general war is being declared. It's a verb, which means uh, the declaration, basically declaration of war. Uh, here, uh, Sebal is having war declared against it, the site of Sebal, that's the Sebal emblem glyph. And here are two monuments from the Tetesh Batun region of uh, Guatemala, classic, late classic Mayan monuments of the 8th century, uh, showing the same guy, a horrible looking uh, Maya, all done up in his war costume, horrifying war costume, holding a spear. And this starts out on top with a uh, date, which uh, in the 52 year calendar round, uh, which goes and says, war is the general war is declared against Sebal by this particular place. Uh, uh, and then uh, three days later, they have captured the uh, ruler of Sebal, which is a huge site um, on the uh, uh, Pasión River, tremendous city. They've captured this guy. And three days later, it says uh, his writing is chopped. In other words, he hasn't got anything else to say, basically because his head has been chopped off. But the way they put it is his writing has been uh, chopped. And then it goes on to tell you who did it. It's this guy here. And we can read all of that monument now. There's nothing, no surprises there whatsoever. From this and from other political monuments having to do with royal marriages and diplomatic missions, uh, visits, uh, uh, attendance at crowning or inauguration rites by the king of one city at the, uh, uh, for, for the new ruler of another city, a political geography can be put together of late classic Maya uh, uh, lowlands. And um, this has been done by Nikolai Gruber in Germany, Simon Martin uh, in uh, England, uh, really in an extraordinary way. Here are the emblem glyphs the basic emblems for the big players here in the lowland Maya area in the 8th century. In fact, beginning even earlier with Tikal here, uh, Kalakmul, its bitter enemy up here to the north, a site that is even bigger than uh, Kalakmul. Palenque is over uh, uh, in here, Piedras Negras, Yaschilan, etc. And from the inscriptions, uh, uh, this kind of diagram can be put together uh, in which uh, th these sort of blue lines represent diplomacy, royal marriages, visits, uh, viewing of inaugurations and so forth. In general, trying to make allies. Kalak Mul is trying to make allies all over the place. On the other hand, with, uh, and it is fighting two bitter enemies, Palenque here and Tikal, which have a lot uh, to share with each other. Tremendous, ancient enmity with Tikal. These people are hereditary enemies. And sometimes one city will be dominant, sometimes another. And then uh, finally, uh, Tikal beat the stuffing out of Kalakmu and captured its king. And that is recorded at Tikal. The most amazing political monument of all, though, is this, which was early seen by John Lloyd Stevens and Catherwood, and drawn by Catherwood, and appears in John Lloyd Stevens' wonderful book, Incidents of Travel in uh, Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan. If you haven't read that, you've got to read it. It's the best account, I still think, of the Maya area, and I've written a few myself. But this guy, Stevens was wonderful. He's the, the patron saint of all Maya studies. Stevens saw this monument and saw that it had 
these guys sitting around on the side of it and a very interesting inscription on the top. There are 16 rulers on this so-called altar, altar queue at the site of Copan. It's the most important monument from Copan, which is in the southeastern part of the Maya area. It used to be thought that these were astronomers uh, who were all debating about the length of the tropical year and trying to get it hooked up to the uh, length of a lunation, which they did, as a matter of fact, at Copan. Uh, but in effect, we now know, thanks to a German scholar named Bertolt Riese, a very good epigrapher in Germany, and uh, later studies by others like Linda Schiele at the University of Texas, we now know that these are the 16 rulers uh, in order of Copan, beginning with the first ruler here, whose name is Yashk Okmo, uh, the first, uh, Quetz uh, first uh, Quetzal Macaw bird. And this is the 16th ruler who put this, had this thing sculpted, whose name is given down here as Yashpasa, which means something like new dawn or first dawn. And he is receiving the torch of office from his distant predecessor, the founder of the dynasty. The 16 unbroken rulers there. It's the greatest dynastic record from anywhere in the New World, going all the way back uh, into the 5th century AD when Copan was founded. The epigraphers worked this thing out. Um, that's the inscription on the top. They worked out the inscription uh, on top and decided that there had to have been a founder named Yashkukmo. Now, I raise this because at the time when, during the 1970s, when the decipherment was really rolling along and really getting together, a whole bunch of people who were the dirt archaeologists got their noses out of joint. Here's all this publicity accruing to these epigraphers and art historians. Why can't we get some publicity? Because we're the people who basically do all the dirty work, which is true. Uh, sitting there in the rain with the bugs crawling all over the place. Uh, they rejected the, uh, basically, and still do many of them, the decipherment saying that even if you could read this stuff, it's just a pack of lies anyway. That it's just a lot of blowhard uh, Maya uh, rulers uh, uh, telling you all, making up these stories about themselves, which are not true. Uh, it's propaganda. Well, is it or is it not? The epigraphers and art historians like Linda Sheila proposed that, in fact, there was a founder of Copan uh, who lived in the fifth century named Yashkukmo. Subsequently, the University of Pennsylvania has found by deep tunneling underneath the main, uh, one of the main buildings at Copan, they have found the tomb of the founder. Of ya and it is the tomb of Yashkukmo. And his successor, immediate successor, uh, who follows him, uh, and uh, the mother of Yashkukmo are in tombs up above. And a whole succession of buildings was built on the top to celebrate the founder, Yashkukmo. And here is when Yashkukmo shows up. Uh, he shows up and he takes Uchamk. Oh, it says on this date uh, he's going to show up. And he shows up from somewhere, and we're sure he's a foreigner, probably coming from central Mexico, from the great site of Teotihuacan. And he takes the symbol of rulership. Uchamk Awil here is what this means, which it's a god who is the absolute symbol of rulership at this place, which can't really be, we think it's a, a place called uh, Choctena, which could be Kirigua, uh, which is next door, or it could be Copan itself. And here is his name. It's conflated. It's the Kukmo. It's um, the, the Lord Kukmo, the first founder. And then three days later than this, uh, he arrives at Copan itself. And here is Yash Kukmo. And here is what subsequently happens. And then finally, it goes through a whole lot of stuff until Yash, uh, Yash Pasa, his 16th successor, centuries later uh, here, has this particular altar dedicated to his distinguished ancestor. Well, <laughs> what more do you want? That's QED. These are not lying inscriptions. They're telling you what the Maya wanted to say, which was actual history which they uh, knew about. There's all kinds of other stuff uh, here. This is a tomb uh, from the site of Rio Azul in northeastern Guatemala, in which uh, there's a date on this tomb. Uh, 
uh, written on the walls, and it says, Mukah, he is buried. And then it names the king who is the lord of this particular place, uh, of this particular city, is buried actually in here. They'll tell you that this guy is buried there. We have a lot of life cycle uh, uh, glyphs actually deciphered by whole teams of epigraphers, many of them uh, in the uh, sort of school of Linda Sheila at the University of Texas. David Stewart and uh, 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 Nikolai Gruber in Germany and Steve Houston, my student from Yale University, uh, came across some amazing uh, decipherments that have to do with the thought systems of these Maya uh, rulers. And it's a world that we never would have suspected before. They have discovered a kind of being, often a, a, a fantastic animal, that in a way is the alter ego uh, or spiritual counterpart of a particular personage. This is a widespread Maya idea that each personage has an animal that lives in a sacred mountain that represents that person. And for kings, it's going to be a jaguar or something wonderful. For slobs like uh, myself, it might be a rat or, you know, or a gopher. But uh, essentially, this is the idea. And it's, the name is Y. And they have shown that this glyph here is Y, is pronounced Y. Uh, the Y means something, can have many, many meanings. It can mean ghost, it can mean the spiritual co-essence. It can also mean a dream. It's got something to do with dreaming. And the place where these Ys were, that were worshipped by particular rulers, was called the Y Beal which can also mean the sleeping house. This is apparently what went on inside the temples. This is the why of the Lord of Sebal. This means uh, a how or king. This is the Sebal emblem glyph. And it says that this jaguar here, well endowed, floating in a, in a lake, uh, is why his why of this particular personage. There are many, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these whys now known. Sometimes they look like humans, like these ones. These are all wise, and, the, and or sometimes they are chimeric animals, like uh, fantastic ones, like this jaguar with vegetation coming off of his head. And each one of these inscriptions identifies him as a particular why of an individual or even of the king of a whole city. This happens to be the, the why of the holy king of Kalakmul, that great city uh, to the north. And these appear on Maya, classic Maya ceramics and nowhere else. And a lot of classic Maya uh, ceramics have to do with this weird spiritual other world of the Maya in ways that Eric Thompson never would have dreamed. Well, most recently, uh, the physical sciences have gone in with uh, the uh, epigraphers to try to rescue a hieroglyphs, hieroglyphic inscriptions in places where they have almost totally disappeared. And this concerns the site of Bonan Park, which was under the thumb of um, Yash Chilan um, in the southwestern part of the Maya area for much of its history. Famous for the extraordinary murals that were discovered in the 1940s there. This is one of the rooms. Um, this is a watercolor copy of the murals. They don't look like this at all now. They're much destroyed. They're very hard to see. Showing the king of Bonampak, a man named Chan Muan, with his, the captives that he has taken in a great battle, and they're having their fingernails uh, torn out. Perhaps, as uh, somebody's recently suggested, because they are scribes that they've captured from the other polity, from the, from the people that they were fighting, and they don't want them ever to write again, uh, which is an interesting theory. This guy's pleading for his life. This guy is probably dead. This person's head has been severed. But incredible. This is the wife of this particular person who's named as being a woman from Yashchilan here. The problem is that these are much faded these uh, uh, now, and the person who, Guatemalan artist who copied these, he did a very good job at half scale back in the 40s, didn't know anything about the hieroglyphs. So many of the copies are probably not right. A team from Brigham Young University, led by Steve Houston, has brought in all the uh, fancy equipment that BYU can produce to scan uh, the actual rooms themselves with uh, video, uh, uh, taking uh, ultraviolet and infrared and uh, scanning it on all kinds of uh, wave bands so they can now 
see many of these what we thought were glyphs that couldn't be read at Bonaparte. This is particularly interesting. It's a bunch of bundles here, which can barely be seen in Antonio Tejeda's copy. It cannot be seen at all today, except using these scanning devices. And it says on it, it gives the figure, uh, the number eight on one of them, on one of these sacks. And then the other thing says P on it, uh, spelled P-I. P is a count of 8,000 among the Maya. They went by 20s. It was a vigesimal system. So, uh, 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 excuse me, it says 5P. So the number 5 versus 8,000 is 40,000. And then it gives the sign for cacao or chocolate down below it. They had stacked up 40,000 cacao beans as an offering up here to this particular important individual seated upon this throne. And this is only been rescued through uh, modern uh, uh, means. Most, many of the uh, re older readings that were given uh, back in the 70s and whatnot, in the enthusiasm of all the epigraphers and art historians who got together for the first time, you know, using Knorozov's approach and Proskurikov's, many of these readings are probably, they've got to be revised. And one of them has to do with place names. Um, this is a site of Palenque, part of it, one of the really great Maya sites with this great mountain towering up above it. There's another one over here. Um, these all have inscriptions in them. There are loads and loads of inscriptions at Palenque in stucco and in stone. Beautiful, beautiful uh, carvings. Um, David Stewart and Steve Houston have found, have written a great study of toponyms and place names in the Maya area. The Maya uh, love to, to label everything, including the cities and places within the cities, like plazas and ball courts and hills around there. And here they have found that, in fact, there is, uh, this used to be read in previously as te, because it looks like a tree sort of bent over. Vegetation has led to some bad interpretations. But it is, in fact, read now, we know from phonetic substitutions given by the Maya elsewhere, lakam, which means great. So kuk, which is quetzal bird, it is a quetzal bird, kuk lakam, the, the, the quetzal great witsi, or wits. Wits is mountain. This is written phonetically, witsi. Uh, this is Kuk Lakam Wits, the great Quetzal Mountain, which I believe could well be that hill that we saw just in the previous thing up above here. This could well be Kuk Lakam Wits here. They're naming something that happened there. They're talking about it. And they said it happens at the polity, at the place called Lakam. This is Lakam again. This is Ha, believe it or not. It's somewhat worn. Uh, the Great Waters. And that is the ancient name for one of the ancient names of the place, Palenque. The whole polity is called Bone, uh, covering a wide, wide area of 100 square miles, perhaps, even. But Lakam Ha is the name of the site of Palenque because it's got water running all through it. It's just full of water and waterfalls and so forth. So it's the great water or the great waters. And this has been a tremendous breakthrough recently. So I'm going to end on this whole thing, believe it or not, on the latest wrinkles. The latest wrinkle is that now, unfortunately, we have to know the grammar. I'm not going to tell it to you now. I got uh, started on a book which, uh, I'm not going to call it this, but it is basically glyphs for dummies. Uh, <laughs> Why not? I mean, these things exist for Egyptology. Uh, for, if you go to Egypt, you can get some wonderful paperback books on how to read ordinary Egyptian inscriptions. Why not the Maya? I thought, this will take me all oh, about a couple of months, and I'll be done. I've been working on it for two years, and I'm still not through, mainly because you have to know the grammar now. It's just like a Latin inscription. You cannot read a Latin inscription in the forum without knowing Latin grammar, and you cannot really read a Maya inscription without knowing Maya grammar. So what's the language of the Maya? Maya writing system. There are about 30 different Mayan languages, all related to each other. Uh, however, we know now for a fact 
that the language in the classic Maya inscriptions is an ancestral form of a language spoken by about 50,000 people today on the border between Guatemala and Honduras called Chorti. Not far from Copan. If you go to Copan, you go right through Chorti country and see Chorti villages. It's the ancestral form of Chorti. It was the literary language of the Maya for centuries, all through the classic. And all Maya inscriptions are in the ancestral form of Chorti. It's like, it's like Latin was to the medieval church. It was a, a sacred language, or literary Chinese to Chinese. Uh, there's some Yucatec words show up in the inscriptions, but even up at Chichen Itza, which is right here, it's still in ancestral Chorti. And we know the grammar of this, and the grammar shows up in the writing system in a very, very sophisticated way. Steve Houston thinks that they had their own grammarians, um, and we're getting a handle on this. This is from a pot from Tikal, part of a detail from a beautiful little stucco vase from a tomb at Tikal. And what they have found here is you have a text up here which usually refers to the dedication, the contents of the pot, and then the owner of the pot, who happens to be a very important lord of Tikal. But these secondary texts refer to what's going on in the pictures. And what's going on in the pictures, it turns out, is often real conversation, actual utterances by these people, because you find uh, use of Maya pronouns, of a very complex pronoun system. You find the use of third-person pronouns, even first-person pro pronouns, I did such and such, or I say such and such, and second-person pronouns, you do such and such, or you are such and such. And here, it says here, this guy who is a young version of the supreme Maya deity, Itzamna, and here's his glyph right down here, spelled Itzamna, it says, Yalahi, Yalahi. Um, said, he said, this is Tsunun, Tsunun is the hummingbird, and here's the hummingbird god sitting here. So said the hummingbird, tu itzamna, ti itzamna, ti means to, itzamna, said the hummingbird to itzamna, and here's what he said up here, and don't ask me this, I haven't worked on this enough now, but this is speech uh, that you get in these, it's just like the comic books, you get things coming out of people's mouths. Uh, here's a really beautiful Maya vase known as the bunny pot, because there's a funny rabbit standing here on this glyph for a mountain. And he's taken all the finery off a very important god we know of only as God, El, taken his headdress and everything from him. And over here it says, this same god now stripped of his, all of his headgear, because the rabbit has taken all this stuff away from him, it, it, it says, over here, there's an inscription which describes what's been taken. He has taken, Uchamar, in book, my, uh, uh, my costume, uh, in patan, uh, my tribute, the things that have been given to me in tribute. That thing here is the first person singular. So now we know that there's actual conversation that is recorded in this. Here's a wonderful Maya pot that I only thought about the other day, unrolled by an artist of mine, uh, late classic Maya, in which an old god here who's partly Itzamna, partly Pawatun, he's uh, talking. And all of these people have speech coming out here. And what uh, he's saying something here, Yalahi said Pawatun Itzamna, which is said he said, or he said it, Itzamna, Pawatun Itzamna, this man here. And he's talking to this little kid here who's got two birds in his hand. And uh, here is what he's telling this guy here. And these people are all talking. This is the next wave. We've got to analyze all these Maya vessels because we've got to find out what they're saying. Even on Maya monuments, there's speech of this sort. This famous uh, uh, lintel or um, so called, uh, it's really a panel, panel three from Piedras Negras, shows, much destroyed, shows a ruler on a throne with all sorts of underlings, some of whom are visitors from other Maya cities and others standing here. There's an Akuhun off to, the, to, to, to this side, who's a kind of master of ceremonies and the librarian. And up in here, barely visible and often not copied by, by people who do these hieroglyphs, is a long text, is what he is saying, full of second-person uh, singular 
uh, pronouns in which he is talking to these people here. You do this, you do that, you do that. This is still to be analyzed. I've just recognized the presence of second person speech uh, here. Here it is uh, here. Long, extremely important inscription, barely visible. There's lots of things we don't know then. We've got to get into actual Maya speech. Um, we don't know the names of a lot of the Maya gods because they're given only logographically. This famous Maya vase uh, rolled out. It's actually a cylindrical vase in the Chicago Art Museum. Uh, there's this dedicatory uh, thing up here which tells you that it uh, once contained chocolate right here. And there's the owner up there. It was probably painted by our friend uh, Ah Masham, the guy from Masham at Naranjo. And it uh, describes a, something that takes place at the beginning of creation in darkness. When all these gods are lined up, here's the creation date right here, and all these gods are named as holy ones uh, in this text. But we cannot match these guys up to the gods. And particularly, we can't match this god. There's God L with his finery on. That's the person who the rabbit stole all the costume from. He's in many, many Maya inscriptions and loads of Maya pots. He's all through the Maya codices, and we don't know his name. I always uh, told my uh, students I'll give 10 bucks to anybody who can ever find his name. <laughs> Someday we'll find it. But that's, a lot of those things are unknown because they're in word signs only, in logographs, without phonetic indicators. No phonetic substitutions. And then another big area of unknown that's just being investigated by people like Steve Houston and David Stewart, and that is, what were these objects anyway that were inscribed with all this writing? They seem to have a life literally of their own. Maya stele. They were important. Uh, they were actors. The stele themselves and the altars in front of them. This is uh, one in which a very important Maya ruler uh, uh, put up to commemorate the ending of a great time period that he happened to be around in. And actions that he took place then, both here and probably on the altar in front of that. These things are as alive as the people to whom they, uh, uh, who they com commemorate. And there's a phrase that usually begins this. Uh, I can't see it on this, but it's there, which says, Ubach, in front of it. Uh, when you get a picture like this of a great Maya personage, of a great Maya ruler, which means his presence, or here he is. And they literally mean that. He's just as much on this Maya monument as he was in real person. And this is an actor in the Maya universe. And we've got to know more about that that we don't know now. I would like to say that there's someday somebody's going to make a fabulous discovery in the Maya area. There are four known Maya codices, and that's all we have. It's all, we only had four books left, let's say, from ancient Greece and Rome. You wouldn't know a lot about ancient Greece and Rome. Yet we know that they probably had tens of thousands of these in royal libraries and elsewhere. Someday, these unfortunately are painted on perishable materials, on bark paper. Someday, somebody in a cave like this, this is Nachtunich in uh, northeastern Guatemala near Belize, somebody is going to find a dry cave with a box, and in that box they're going to find 10 new Maya codices. I don't know if I'm going to live long enough for this, but it's going to change everything we know about the Maya. We will now, we'll find their literature there. We'll find things that they knew about that we can only dream about at this point. We have such little information, except what has been preserved from the climate and everything else, and from destruction by the Maya themselves and by the Spaniards. So little left that there's so much still to know. That site of uh, uh, Natunich, that cave, we know that scribes came into there over and over again through the centuries and put their inscriptions up to say they came there from various Maya cities, from Kalakmul, for instance, uh, to make fire ceremonies and to dedicate. And they, they, they worshiped in these caves as pilgrims because they're the entrances to the underworld, to the other world. Uh, we know they, I'm positive they would have left codices in here, in specially holy places there, in wooden boxes that are mainly gone. Someday somebody's going to find the loot there, and that's going to completely change uh, uh, everything. The question is, uh, 
could everybody read this stuff? We don't know that. How many people could actually read and write in this system? And there's no way to ever know that. How much of this esoteric knowledge that was in the Maya centers trickled down to the, to the boonies, to all the people who lived in the Maya villages scattered across the landscape. I think more people could read that system than uh, epigraphers give credit for. Uh, Linda Sheila used to teach the rudiments of that down at Texas in Maya weekends. In one weekend, to get people so they get a pretty good idea of what's going on. They were not great translators, but they could at least get an idea of what it said. And I think that uh, the average Maya peasant, pretty sharp character, could probably do the same thing. Writing systems like this are much easier to read than to write. Anybody who's ever tried to deal with Chinese newspapers knows that. Uh, it doesn't take you terribly long to get so you get a reading knowledge of Chinese. It takes a long time to be able to write it properly. And the same thing was undoubtedly uh, uh, true here. So that's the, that's the story of the Maya decipherment. One of the great questions in my mind is, how is it that if it's true, and it is true, that you have all these little polities all fighting with each other all the time, taking captives and raising general hell uh, with each other, how is it that there's a single classic Maya culture? How is it that, for instance, corrections to the uh, lunar calendar uh, that had to do with the exact length of a tropical year. How is it that they went all the way from Copan down here, all the way through the rest of the Maya area, if they were always at each other's throats? And this is something that we don't know and we ha must find out. There must have been some place that was protected that scholars and Itzat, the wise people, could go to. The keepers of the holy books, the royal librarians, the astronomers could all gather in where they would be protected and not touched. And my guess is that that's going to be Copan. There are almost no military monuments at Copan except in the very late times. The only time anything ever happens militarily to Copan is that the poor ruler named uh, 18 Washak Lahun Ubachawil, who put up most of the monuments you see at Copan, got himself captured by uh, a place that was subservient to him. And I think it was just a lucky fluke, and he had his head cut off. And then Copan comes back again. Uh, it's a place we know where the scribes were so important that they had their, not only their own palace, but probably their whole district was nothing but um, uh, scribes and their uh, great entourages. So I think there must have been a place like Alexandria with uh, its great library, with a great library where all of Maya culture was preserved. But that has yet to be found. There's a lot to be found still. We don't know it all. We cannot read it all, but we will someday. Thank you. Be willing to entertain some uh, questions. but it's been reprinted many, many times. You can get it in all kinds of reprinted editions. And even the original one was put out in such quantity that it is, that it's a, you can find a, a, an original copy for not too much money. The captain was wonderful engravings in it. And then they went back to Yucatan later, another trip, and he wrote Incidents of Travel in Yucatan. And they're wonderful books. I think he was the best travel writer ever. And a wonderful man, yes. To what extent are living Mayans today able to help yeah. with your research? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, to what extent do the living Maya today, uh, do they help the research and do they participate? Uh, I wish they could participate more. Linda Sheila and uh, Nikolai Gruba uh, set up workshops for uh, the Maya, not only in uh, Guatemala City and uh, Antigua and around there, but also uh, in Yucatan, uh, in, in, in Merida. 
uh, for the Yucatec uh, Maya. And there's tremendous interest among the Maya in this. Uh, their own writing system, which was wiped out by the hated Spaniards, um, they want to go back and, and, and learn this. And they are, they are doing this. Um, it, it's not taught, unfortunately, in the state school system of those countries. So uh, they're going to only get it uh, from the workshops. That's returning to the Maya, what is the Maya? Um, secondly, the contemporary Maya um, have not lost all their culture. This is not a dead civilization by a long shot. There's at least six million Maya living today, even though the countries that uh, rule them don't admit this and leave them out of their censuses as much as they can. There are at least six million Maya, living Maya, and uh, many of the ways of thought and of custom and traditional ways of life still continue today and are a constant source of inspiration to people looking for interpretation to what we see in the iconography and in the uh, inscriptions. So it's a, it's a, it, it really is a two-way street going on. Yes, please. Back in the late 70s, when I first started studying about the Maya and yeah. their descriptions, the name Kalak Mul was not very well known. That's what correct. Was most of the important work done uh, regarding Kalak Mul, and when was its uh, yeah. significance really uh, realized? Right. Well, Kalak Mul used to be a terrible place to get to. I mean, I really, if you have been on Bad Muddy Road, you've never been on Bad Muddy Road that bad. Uh, secondly, most of the monuments at Kalak Mul are in terrible shape. They're on very poor quality limestone. They're very difficult to read. They can be read, some of them at any rate. Uh, so therefore, the, the size of the site was not known, and the importance of its monuments were, were not known. And because people could not read the, uh, did not know about the emblem, but people did not realize that its emblem, which appears in many, many other places, even at Copan, uh, as a great city. Uh, so this was recognized as a great city by other politics, like Copan or Palenque or Tikal. Tikal recognizes a bitter enemy as the worst enemy they ever had. Uh, there have been more recent field expeditions there. Uh, uh, one sponsored in Yucatan by the state of Campeche, uh, run by, by William Fullen, no, no longer there, I believe. And more recently, uh, by the Institute, uh, uh, the Mexican National Institute of Anthropology. There is now a first, for the first time, a first-rate epigrapher working there, Simon Martin, who's a young Englishman, uh, without uh, any advanced degree whatsoever. He's one of the very best people ever to get into biohieroglyphic writing. And he is recording all the possible inscriptions of Kalak Mul. He's a world expert on Kalak Mul history. So we're getting to know Kalak Mul now. It's a huge place. Is this, is this the same city that you referred to as El Mirador, or are they very close? No, El Mirador is not far from Calacmo, it's to the south. El Mirador is probably the largest of all cities ever built by the Maya, but it's pre-classic what you're looking at. It goes back beyond the beginning of the classic. I'll show a picture of it uh, on my third lecture, the reconstruction. It's the largest of all, and it's probably begun at least by 200 BC. And then by about 300 AD, it's lost its importance. There's never a bigger one. Yes? In this language family to the Maya languages, the Long and Tuatha, yeah. they, the, the, Maya, the Mayan language family is its own language family. It's, it's the equivalent to, say, Indo-European, for instance, uh, among ourselves. We all speak an Indo-European language, English. There are many other Indo-European languages, including Sanskrit, for instance. Well, Mayan is the same way. There are 30 members. Probably others have, are now extinct, but still spoken by an awful lot of people. 30 different languages. Up in Yucatan, there's Yucatan Maya, for instance, is spoken there. You can hear it on the streets of Merida being uh, 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 spoken. Um, it's some linguists, like the late Edwards up here, tried to hook up, uh, and, and Laura Swadish, tried to hook up uh, Mayan, the Mayan languages with other language families into larger, what they call uh, a larger phylum. But really, that's not accepted by a lot of linguists. Uh, you can't go that far back and still find convincing linkages. My old colleague and uh, 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 friend, 
the main Floyd Lounsbury really didn't believe you could hook up the Mayan languages convincingly to any other one. Uh, when you get back that far uh, to, to the Ur Maya, you cannot do it. So they belong to their own group, and they're all very much cohesive together, with one exception, Washtec, which is found way up the Gulf Coast, heading towards Texas. And for the rest of them all are in a big cluster there, Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, Chapel. Yeah, um, the, the recent discoveries, the limestone palace, the caves, the uh, caves, uh, with any opinion on that, like, uh, we can find any uh, common food goes around, is there a place that's in the caves? Uh, which caves? There's so many caves now. Uh, I'm not a true scholar, I'm not saying can't. There's, 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 well, the caves in the Maya area, Maya, the Maya area is largely car, karst limestone and heavy rainfall. So there are caves everywhere. Yucatan's filled with caves, a lot of them unexplored, some of them huge. Uh, that whole area going down from the highlands into the lowlands is just filled with caves. And there are uh, people who are both speleologists and archaeologists at the same time. Uh, and they have been making some great, great discoveries. There's no doubt about it. Many of the uh, well-known Maya sites have caves underneath them. In fact, there's probably as much underground as there is above ground. Uh, I hate them. I get claustrophobic, so I won't go into them usually. Uh, the Maya will tell you that they're uh, cursed if you go in there, so watch your step. And uh, there's been some weird stories about that, too. Uh, there was a cave. There's a cave up uh, just north of Tulum place called Tancac, which has a cenote, a natural well in it. And uh, the local Maya said that there, it's cursed anybody who goes in there is going to get a broken palm. Major, major break. Well, the National Geographic uh, went in there, the photographers, and every one of those people cut, cut broken bones for their troubles. So then I, uh, as being a total agnostic, I said, well, I'm going into this thing. To hell with it. And uh, I broke my ankle two weeks later. <laughs> so I don't go into caves. But uh, there are some really good people like Jim Brady, uh, one of the explorers of the big Nakhru Niche Dam. Uh, there's lots and lots of stuff in there. It's very important to the Maya. Yes, sir. Can you speak a little about the Popol Vuh? Yeah. I could go on all night about the Popol Vuh. The Popol Vuh is, which means the Book of the Mat, or Book of Council, is a sacred book of the Maya Kiche, uh, of uh, the dominant group of people of Highland Guatemala uh, at the time of the conquest. After the conquest, uh, their great epic, the Popol Vuh, was written down in Spanish letters. And it has been preserved, it's been translated many, 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 many times. The best translation is by Dennis Tedlock, uh, which is in print. And it's a great book. And it covers everything from the creation of the universe to the Spanish conquest and even through it. But the really interesting part is the creation part and then what takes place at the end of the last creation. There have been multiple creations and destructions, just like in the Hindu world. And at the end of the last creation, uh, the world is destroyed by floods and uh, everything has to start anew. And at that point, the, this epic story of the hero twins and their harrowing of hell, the harrowing of the underworld, takes place. Uh, you saw the twins on the resurrection play, Hunafu uh, and Shpalanke, on either side, watering their father, who is the maze god, as, he, as he's being resurrected from the underworld through the surface of the earth. It's an agricultural story. The farmer plants the corn with a digging stick, putting the corn kernels in, he sends them into the underworld, Shibaba, what the Maya call it. They die. They go into the underworld. They are the maze gods. But then they have to be resurrected Well, uh, uh, when the rains come and they sprout again. That's what the, the basic underlying theme is of that part of the Popo book. But it's in the form of this young set of twins, the hero twins, who go in uh, to the underworld to find their father and uncle and play ball with the lords of the underworld. Their father and their uncle have gone in previously and have been defeated. It's got many, many side stories with it, too. It's a very complicated thing. And eventually, through trickery and through their talent as ball players, they defeat the lords of the underworld. 
and the, they find their father's bones and skull and resurrect and put them together and they uh, then ascend up, resurrect him and they themselves, as in the book it says, they rise up to, to the skies, to the heavens and become the sun and the moon. Uh, I found in my investigations of classic Maya pottery that there are many, many rep uh, representations of various aspects of this story. You saw one there, the resurrection thing. Uh, I found this in the early 70s. And I began to talk up the idea that uh, why does, you know, we could take that and we could do an animated film on this thing, tell that part of the football blue story. So I asked around, asked around various meetings, does anybody know an animator who would do this? Well, it so happened in Berkeley, California, there was, there was an animator, Patricia Amlin, who uh, had her own company and who was a Maya pop and been to some of these meetings and whatnot, knew quite a lot about the Maya and knew everybody in the field and she wanted to do it. So uh, she did it and we did it. And I was her advisor on this. And the film called The Popo Pu is out, you can see it. It's pre-computer animation. So it's done, each shot had to be done one at a time, you know, the enormous camera, and all the set up in the back street of Berkeley. But I think it came out pretty darn well. I like the film. It's weird. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, wait, wait a minute, please. Yeah. Uh, does research exist into inscribed objects in private collections? Yes, I do it all the time. My theory about this is that uh, in private and public collections in museums, this stuff is out of the ground anyway. Um, you might as well study this before it disappears. What I object to are, are, are the private collections where the private collector will not a, uh, say that he, he or she is going to give it to a public museum and b not let anybody look at this stuff. Let's gloat over it, you know. Uh, but I'd say there isn't an important figure for, for iconography going in the my area who doesn't work with uh, private collections as well as materials dug up by archaeologists. If you'd only worked with material dug up by archaeologists, we wouldn't have found a quarter of the things that we have found uh, uh, that reflect on Maya culture history. And it's more important for the Maya and their history to look at this stuff and to take the high moral ground and say it all should be ground up and thrown into the sea. Uh, I don't believe that. Um, the, the Rosetta Stone was not found under controlled conditions. It was looted, as a matter of fact. And look at what's come from the Rosetta Stone. So I don't, uh, there's an amazing amount of hypocrisy in this area, though. Amazing. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, you have to speak up. I can't quite hear. Okay. Uh, years ago, I saw some of the collection of Barry Bowen in Belize City. Yeah. Um, he's quite an No, I, I, I'm really, I'm really not. But I'm sure something somebody has. Usually, what happens is that somebody like David Stewart or Simon Martin would go in and copy all the, you know, the hieroglyphic writing over what they had, and that's how I, I find out about it. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know that particular collection. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, regarding the ball game, um, I'm concerned. Uh, in Mexico, there's studies that uh, a lot of the depictions of the sacrifices in Mexico are yeah. symbolic. And regarding the game, supposedly the winning team is sacrificed, yeah. and uh, Satchel Page, the baseball player who played the Mexican League, was told this story, and he said, that's impossible. If it happened, the game would still be going on, and the score would be 0-0. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you know yeah. about how much symbolic yeah, that's, that's an impossible question to answer. We know so little about the ball game, actually. There are many kinds of ball games, not just the ones where you're hit with the hip. All kinds of stick games were played and whatnot. We had representations of them all through Mesoamerica. So the ball game is it's a very complicated subject. We don't know how it was scored. You can only guess. Uh, there are very few good ethnographic or uh, ethno-historic descriptions of it. How it was the, the, the Spaniards usually, they saw it, they just say, 
all these people gam gambled on it, you know, that was all they were interested in was the gambling side. Um, we just don't, don't know, I, 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 but certainly there's, I think, fairly good evidence that in, under certain conditions, a, a defeated uh, Maya big shot who was captured would be forced into one of these ball games. But I don't think that's the way they play ball all the time. Uh, I think that was a, probably a rare event. There's uh, at Yashiman, one of the uh, reliefs of Yashiman shows a ball bouncing against a, a, a set of stairs, and inside the ball is a wrapped up captive. <laughs> My colleague Mary Miller once suggested that maybe they actually stuck the captive into a rubber ball and <laughs> bounced it down the stairs. I can't imagine the ball with, anybody could play with a ball like that, but uh, the ball itself, uh, when the classic Maya show it, has a hieroglyph usually on it, beginning with a coefficient. Uh, there's never much beyond 12 or 13 bar and die coefficient, and then the word nav. If you look at the Maya dictionaries about nav, one of the main meanings of nav is hand spent. And what I think is that this is a measure of the, of the size of the ball. I don't think they always played with a solid rubber ball. I think those scenes on the Maya pottery show these huge ball that size. That's not a solid rubber ball. I think it really was that size very often, and I think it was inflated. I think they had perfectly good methods of inflating rubber balls. And uh, uh, so that, they come in different sizes. So you'll have a nine handstand one, or a seven handstand one, or 12 handstand one, and they'll tell you that that game was played with that. So, but I can't prove it because nobody's ever found it inflated by a rubber ball. Uh, yes, right. What was the noise of the classic Oh, no. that's a whole story. Uh, that's had a long history, talking about the collapse of Maya civilization. It depends on what the fads are, scientific and scholarly fads at particular time. But there's no evidence now that there are multiple causes. Uh, there's no easy solution to this. One of them definitely is environmental degradation, overuse of the land. There's tons of evidence for this. It's really good. The Maya area has been well studied from this point of view by agronomists, soil scientists, geomorphologists, uh, pollen analysts, they're taking late cores and whatnot. There's no question that they really, that they had greatly exceeded the current capacity of their land. A huge population. Um, and I, I, I'm just absolutely convinced of it. But that's not the only thing. There's also recent, very good evidence that there was a major Maya drought uh, at the end, uh, during and at the end uh, of the, well, beginning with the ninth, beginning of the ninth century. And this was a major, major drought that lasted many, many years. Uh, so there are two factors that just by themselves would be enough to, to tip the balance. There's plenty of evidence for widespread destruction of the monuments at this point. City after city stops putting the monuments up, and they are smashed. You lose the eyes and the mouth. They go after that. But they smash these monuments to pieces, which is why it's so difficult to, to read a lot of them now. Um, and that uh, shows that there's something social going on at this time. Invasion or revolution or a combination of these things. I think all of them put together. There's also evidence for outside people coming in at this time. We'll see the same arguments when I talk in my third lecture about Encore. Uh, the, the, the same arguments that come up for Encore, same stories go on, and same questions are left about the collapse of Encore. Um, I think it was a whole lot of things all came together. What happens at the end of that is that all these things that I've been talking about are cut off just like that. Uh, the Maya elite are no longer the elite that we could do. There are no more holy lords of Tikal or Naranjo or any other place. There are no more scribes that we can identify. They've all gone. There are no more teachers of the holy book. There's no more pictorial Maya pottery. There's no more Popo Go imagery on the pottery or any other kind of imagery. Uh, and people are coming in from the outside, bringing in central Mexican ways of doing things. Everything changes at this point between 800 and 900. And uh, 
So I, 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 it's just like the, the end of Rome. You can't point to one thing that ended the Roman Empire, but a whole lot of things finally come together and bam, all that. It's like when a species disappears. It's usually biological species. It's usually not just one thing. It's just a whole lot of blows that all land at the same time. And you, the, the, the only thing to do is to get the hell out of there. And that's what they did, apparently. And they, they most of the Maya left the, the central Maya lows, moved north, and probably moved south up into the highlands at that point. Yes. Um, the earliest Maya inscriptions that are definitely Maya are probably not long after the time of Christ, which you can identify as being in Maya. Uh, until then, you're not 100% sure that you're dealing with Maya. You probably are there. Uh, the linguists look at the distribution of Maya languages, and uh, they want to take the Maya from an original homeland up in northwestern Guatemala in the highlands, a sort of west of way, way down on the border with Chap. I don't know if there's any archaeological evidence for this. The Maya have probably been where they are now for a very, very long period of time. Thousands of years, probably before they show up on the scene with their writing system. So that's all we know about the origin of the Maya. The curious thing about the Maya Lowlands is that um, there's no good early archaeological evidence for early village cultures there. Uh, there's no Olmec influence in there. Uh, at the time the old Mac were flourishing on the Gulf Coast, we don't know much of anything about anybody seeing in the Maya Lowlands. Uh, it may be an artifact of the archaeologists that they don't know where to look. Um, I know where to find old Mac because I've done it. Uh, they just haven't been looking at the right environment. I don't know what it is, but uh, the, 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 all the southern Lowlands looked like they were kind of unoccupied until about 1,000 B.C from where it stands now. And that's late as far as the old Mecca is concerned. So uh, they undoubtedly received influence from the old Mecca. The old Mecca invented many of the things I think that the Maya are credited with. And I think the Maya always knew of that bunch of people as being the ancient civilization, the way our European ancestors know that Greece and Rome is where a lot of Western Europe originated too. They knew of that as an ancient civilization. But that's all we know about my origins. We don't know a lot, actually. Yes, please. Uh, is there any evidence for uh, when, where, uh, what date it was first? No. Uh, of course, the, the, I think the Popol Vuh stories, the whole cycle was everywhere through the Maya area. Uh, and uh, which one of the lowland cities could have originated? I don't. I think it originated. I don't think it originated in my own. The first evidence we have, pictorial evidence for it, showing scenes from the Polo Grove, is outside the Maya area proper. It's uh, in Chapas, in southeastern Chapas, near Tapachula, on the Guatemala border, at the site of Isapa, which the New World Archaeological Center is wonderful work at. And the monuments from Isapa which dates probably from no earlier than 400 BC till about 100 AD, show absolutely Popo Vu imagery in them. That's when the story starts, as far as we know. And that really isn't in the Maya area of Yes, please. Is there any uh, connection between the astronomical observations of the Maya and uh, other civilizations like the Egyptians and their uh, connection with the Pleiades uh, constellation and so forth? The, the, the Egyptians were lousy astronomers compared to the Maya. <laughs> they really were. They were nowhere compared to the Maya. The Maya were really very advanced astron naked eye astronomers. They knew uh, a lot about a lot of the planets, about the moon and about eclipses and whatnot far in advance of what the Egyptians ever knew. The, if you want to start connecting them to something else, I would look to East and Southeast Asia. Um, the Han Chinese, as um, Joseph Needham, the great uh, writer on uh, Chinese science, noted himself, had exactly the same kind of eclipse calendar that the, that the Maya did, as found in the Maya dress and codex. Whether that's uh, convergent evolution, or actual connection, 
Uh, I don't know, but there's, uh, I think if you want to look at connections with other civilizations, you should look to Southeast Asia and East Asia. What influence, what influence would you say that all these astronomical observations had on the day-to-day -day culture uh, and the overall development of the Mayan civilization? They evidently spent a lot of time observing the sky and yeah. all the time talking about the underworld. What, uh, what happened there? Well, uh, as you go down to the Maya area today, unless you're in Bay, there was a now polluted. Every night, the sky is not up. You know, it's not like being in Connecticut and trying to look at the stars. Uh, uh, people in the tropics look at the stars because you just can't miss them. Uh, and they start getting interested. They see that the planets are doing strange things. You know, when the planets go into retrograde motion, uh, as they, they, you know, they do. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty weird thing. And the Maya took note of that. They had such knowledge of the planets that they tracked them against the background of the stars. And uh, retrograde motion uh, would sometimes set off wars, actually. And many of the President uh, Bonaparte, uh, the Jupiter was particularly important to uh, the king of Palenque. And uh, he hooked his whole kind of life to what went on with the planet to, to Jupiter. They had a really accurate knowledge of this kind of stuff. And the skies are so <coughs> usually so clear that uh, it's like being in the desert in the Near East. You really get a great view of them without any question. They're brilliant down there. And I think that's why they, rather than say the, uh, the, the Shoshone or somebody, had a very complicated uh, knowledge of astronomy. They also had a writing system to record. And you have to keep records of a long period of time. For instance, to work out an eclipse day, you have to see the intervals at which eclipses are likely to take place. And then if it can take place now, after so many days or months, lunar months, another one is going to occur, uh, 179 or 180 days. They knew, but that took me through keeping tables, and they had tables. Yes? Do they have some evidence of the tools they had to do pottery? <laughs> yeah. Um, th these people had no metal. Classic Maya. Metal doesn't come in until about after 800 AD of any sort. And it's just ornaments, gold ornaments. Uh, everything they did was, was stone on stone. And uh, the average excavation of a Maya, big classic Maya site, comes up with thousands of stone tools, many of which are small axes, many of which are larger axes for cutting stone on stone, cutting wood. And those can be analyzed uh, with binocular microscopes for wear patterns to see what kind of materials they were using. They had obsidian uh, imported. It had to be brought in. There's no natural obsidian in the Maya. Well, this is a black volcanic glass, and it can take a, a tremendously sharp. And uh, they use that for many, many things besides making knives and spear points. Uh, they use it for cutting and shaping wood. Uh, you can look at Maya reliefs and actually see the workmanship on it, uh, where, where they hadn't completed a piece or where they hadn't polished it too well. You can actually see how the artist five or six guys would be working on the same piece. So you can track all of that. Do they actually uh, stain the pottery? Uh, they, uh, the Maya made, supposedly, all their pottery by the coiled method, coiling, hand coiling. Uh, but uh, the Maya, uh, in colonial times and today, up in Yucatan, has a very simple wheel that's turned with the foot uh, down below. So I think it's called a kapal. And they turn this, this darn thing. So it produces real wheel marks uh, on it. And I think they found these on uh, pre-Spanish pre Maya pottery. But most of their pottery was made by hand without the use of the wheel. And the reason why I'm asking this is, have they ever tried to like, go through the, the process of Uh, Linda Sheila, have they ever gone through the things that, that the uh, Maya did themselves? Linda Sheila, uh, the late Linda Sheila, great, great friend of mine, 
she was a wonderful artist. She was an artist before she was a figurist. And she, she really reproduced quite a few things that the Maya made. She was scary. And if she'd ever gone into the faking business, no one would protect her. I can tell you, she had at J carving release. There's a woman in, uh, in Germany who does this too. Really quite extraordinary. Reproducing the techniques that the Maya used. Yeah, they, they, they're not, not enough people have done that though. Yeah, because as I'm watching Gabby talk about the new kind of uncover the difference that different albums are taking to uncover a lot. And I'm trying to see a correlation in the process of the pottery and the carvings. Well, he wasn't interested in material culture as much as he was in the right. One more question, I think we're done. Thank you.